Good morning, everyone, and welcome to today's class, which is Casualty Losses. And we're going to move over to page two of the manual. And today's class is part of a week-long series that we're doing on Schedule A. And in earlier classes in this series, we covered medical, dental expenses, taxes, interest, and gifts to charity. And today we're going to be covering casualty losses, casualty and theft losses in this one-hour class. And then in the afternoon, we're going to have a three-hour class that covers the miscellaneous deductions that appear in the lower part of the Schedule A. And in the afternoon class, we will also cover the limit on itemized deductions and how alternative minimum tax can take away benefits associated with itemized deductions. So we're going to move on now to page three of the manual, and we're going to be looking at some definitions, and we're also going to be learning how the IRS identifies when you actually have a casualty loss as opposed to when you don't have a casualty loss or when you have a theft and when you don't have a theft. And there is a continuity between the way the IRS looks at a situation and the way an insurance company looks at a situation. And by that, what I mean is, if an event happens in your life that causes damage to your property, and it is the type of damage that insurance will typically cover, then it is in all likelihood the type of event that the IRS would categorize as a casualty. And if something happens to property you own and the insurance adjuster comes out and says, sorry, we don't cover that, Odds are it's because it's the type of event that is not a casualty. And if it's not a casualty and insurance won't cover it, it's unlikely that the IRS will allow that either. So it's not a steadfast rule, but it is a method by which you could uh, determine whether or not it's probably something that would be covered by the IRS's casualty and theft loss rules. Now, you may be able to claim a deduction for losses that you sustain due to loss in the value of your property that results from casualty or theft. You may not deduct casualty and theft losses that are covered by insurance unless you file a timely claim for reimbursement and you must reduce the loss by the amount of any reimbursement. A casualty loss can result from the damage, destruction, or loss of your property from a sudden, unexpected, or unusual event such as a flood, hurricane, tornado, fire, earthquake, or volcanic eruption. A casualty does not include normal wear and tear or the progressive deterioration of your property. Now, we are, of course, I feel like on the news that there are more casualties going on around the nation than has historically been the case. I mean, usually there's some part of the country that's going through some kind of a difficulty at various times, but I swear (laughs) there's nowhere in the United States, maybe except for the Pacific Northwest where I live, where it's really a great place to be right now in terms of weather. California has fires and droughts, and out in the Midwest you've got tornadoes, you've got snowstorms, you've got drought, and then you go to the East Coast and it's hurricanes. It's something going on at all times, and so... It could just be an impression, but I do feel like there are more weather incidents going on these days than used to be the case. So perhaps casualty losses are a good topic for many people in the country to be learning about because you probably have clients coming in who've suffered from some event or another. And we're going to be talking about what you need to do to identify when an event that they have gone through is going to qualify as a casualty and how you figure the amount of loss that they'll be able to claim a deduction for. So let's first identify when a casualty qualifies, what makes it a qualifying event. You may be able to deduct your casualty loss, but to be deductible, the loss must be sudden. That is an event that is swift and not gradual or progressive. It must also be unexpected, an event that would not normally be anticipated and is also unintended. And finally, the event must be unusual, an event that is not day-to-day in occurrence and is not typical of the type of activity on which you are engaged. Now, I've got a list here of examples of the types of events that IRS has determined were, in fact, qualifying casualty losses. And in the next column, the right-hand column, I have a list of events that the IRS determined were not casualty losses. And going through each of these items can help you clarify in your mind with some level of accuracy when an event qualifies as a casualty and when it doesn't. So the first event that is likely to qualify as a casualty is a car accident, also earthquakes, fires, and floods, government-ordered condemnations resulting from natural disasters, hurricanes, mine cave-ins, shipwrecks, sonic booms, storms, tornadoes, vandalism, (laughs) volcanic eruptions, 
damage caused by insect infestations capable of destroying a tree in five to ten days. Now, most insect infestations will kill a plant over a period of months or years, but there are certain types of insect infestations, and I've seen them on the news, these great huge Asian beetles with big spots on them that can decimate a tree in a few days. That type of event would qualify as a casualty. Also, a death of a horse who swallowed a hat lining was allowed. Cracking of a house foundation walls caused by soil shrinkage during a drought. Collapse of garage wall from subhydraulic action. Damage caused by mine cave-in, even though the landslide was reasonably foreseeable. Bursting of hot water boiler in home. Damage to furniture dropped by movers. Damage caused by a flood due to faulty construction. However, the deduction is limited to the cost of the items that were damaged and not the cost of reconstruction. Any damage that was caused by lightning. Damage to a ring inadvertently dropped into a kitchen garbage disposal. Damage to ring caused by a car door slamming onto it. Damage caused to septic tank by plowing. Damage to a beach due to abnormal rains. Damage to a home by ice and snow. Damage to a home caused by a hurricane that occurred two years ago, but the IRS required you to go back to the earlier year where that hurricane occurred and deduct the loss then. Damage from floodwaters caused by storms. Damage to trees and shrubs caused by accidental chemical poisoning. Damage to trees caused by storms and blizzards. Loss of trees, grass, and shrubs from fire. Damage to household items caused by vandals who broke into the home. And finally, damage and destruction of art objects by vandals. So those were all clear examples of the types of things that the IRS does allow. And now we're going to look at the things IRS has said, sorry, can't claim it. We begin with accidental breakage of household articles such as glassware and china under normal conditions. Damage caused by a family pet. Damage caused by a fire you willfully set or paid someone else to set. A car accident caused by your willful negligence or neglect. Progressive deterioration such as the steady weakening of a building due to wear and tear. Damage to a water heater that bursts after it deteriorated over time. However, the damage to the water heater was not allowed, but there was an allowance for the loss of the items that were damaged by the water heater. So when the water heater burst because it was old, Iris said no to the replacement of the water heater, but it said yes to everything that was destroyed when the water burst and soaked it all. Most non-business losses caused by drought. Water well that ran dry because of a drought. Damage to shrubs eaten by a horse, damage to an antique vase by a cat, damage to fur coat caused by moths. So what you're seeing here is there is damage that is occurring, but apparently the IRS says it's not unexpected or unusual that these things are going to happen. If you have a cat that climbs on your furniture and gets on furniture and things get knocked off, it can be anticipated that that cat is going to damage property. It would not be unusual for a pet to damage property, and that's why these items are failing the test. Also, the loss of a valuable dog that strayed off was not allowed. Damage caused by normal wear and tear of a car. Damage to a car caused by overloading the vehicle. Damage to a car caused by exposure to salt water. And amounts you pay someone else to compensate them for your negligence. For example, a woman paid the owner of a house for damages she caused when she accidentally drove her car into it. The forced sale of a car due to divorce. Damage to a car caused by potholes in the road. Sale of items by a storage company because you did not make payment. The event was not unexpected or unusual. In fact, it's in the contract that they can do that. The loss of a ring from an owner's finger. The loss of a ring you accidentally threw out. The accidental dropping of your eyeglasses or a watch. The loss of baggage and contents in transit. The snapping of a propeller on a yacht that was not the result of a shipwreck or other casualty. Damage to trees from Dutch elm disease. This disease is progressive and it is not sudden or unexpected. And also the gradual suffocation of a tree's root system over a 16-month period was not allowed. Damage to palm trees caused by lethal yellowing, termite or moss damage. The death of a horse from colic. Colic is the number one killer of horses, and broken legs are right up there too. But colic is usually what kills horses, so it's not unusual at all for a horse to get colic. And then finally, the loss of livestock due due to disease is not allowed. Let's move on to theft losses now, because we've looked at a good description there of how to identify when you've had a casualty loss. Let's look at now the definition of a theft loss. 
A theft is the taking or removing of property with the intent to deprive the owner of it. The theft must be illegal under the law of the state where it occurred, and it must have been done with criminal intent. Theft includes the following acts. Blackmail, burglary, or embezzlement, extortion, kidnapping for ransom, larceny, robbery, and threats. But theft does not include lost or mislaid property. However, an accidental loss or disappearance can qualify as a casualty if it results from an identifiable event that is sudden, unusual, or unexpected. So if you are caught up in a community where a tornado has gone through and destroyed property and in all of the confusion you lose your purse and everything in it, that could be tied to an event that is unusual and swift and sudden, and therefore it could be loud. Loss on deposits. A loss on deposits occurs when a bank or financial institution becomes insolvent or bankrupt. If you incur this kind of loss, you can deduct your loss in any one of the following three ways. So for casualty and theft losses, these personal losses, there's essentially one way to claim it, and that's by filling out the casualty loss form, figuring your deduction, and claiming it on Schedule A. But with losses on deposits, you actually have choices in the ways that you claim these losses. The first choice is that you can claim the loss as a casualty loss. But you could also claim it as an ordinary loss or as a non-business bad debt. Now, if you're going to claim it as a casualty loss, you're going to report the loss on Form 4684 first and then carry the loss to Schedule A, Line 20. If you wish to claim it as an ordinary loss, then you would report the loss on Schedule A, Line 23, subject to the 2% limit. Not sure why someone would claim it as a casualty when they can do it as an ordinary, because the limits are a lot less under ordinary, but you can do it either way. And then finally, as a non-business bad debt, if you do it that way, you report it on Schedule D, Form 1040. And, of course, when you claim a bad debt on Schedule D, 1040, that bad debt is limited to $3,000 a year. But it is considered to be a short-term loss, and so a bad debt is always treated as short-term, and so it can be used to offset short-term gains. Proof of loss. You must be able to prove the theft or loss occurred, and the records you are required to keep differ according to whether the loss was from a casualty or theft. For casualty losses, your records should show all of the following. The type of casualty and when it occurred. That the loss was a direct result of the casualty and that you were the owner of the property or that you were contractually liable for the property. And whether a claim for reimbursement exists for which you expect any recovery. And by claim for reimbursement, we mean did insurance cover it and do you expect to get money from insurance. For theft losses, your records should show all of the following. When you discovered that your property was missing, that your property was stolen, and that you were, in fact, the owner of the property. Where to deduct the personal or casualty loss? Will you deduct a non-business casualty loss by completing Form 4684, Section A, and attaching it to your Form 1040 return? And then you will claim the loss on line 20 of your Schedule A. Now, 4684 is actually a two-part form. There is Section A on one side, and if you flip it over, there's Section B on the other side. And we're going to spend most of today's class looking at Section A and the rules for Section A. And at the very end, I'm going to throw up Section B for you. How you complete it is very similar, but how the loss carries to your tax return differs with Section B. So let's look at Section A here. 4684, Section A, Personal Use Property. On line one, you can see we have property A, property B, property C, and property D. And what will happen is the description that you enter for property A is going to correlate to what you then enter in column A, column B, column C, and column D. With some kinds of losses, you could have so many items that are being listed that you would actually have to do worksheets or supplementary pages and begin attaching them. For today's class, we're keeping the quantity of losses or the quantity of items that we're reporting very small just for simplicity, but it would not be unusual at all if you were involved in a major natural disaster in an area that you would have pages and pages and pages of items that were lost because the IRS actually asks you to list every one of them if you can believe it. All right, so in line one, you're going to describe each item of property that was lost from a single event. Multiple items can be lost within a single event. So let's look at a hurricane as an example. During a hurricane, your house could lose, lose its roof and all of the possessions that you have in the house could be damaged or destroyed. You could also have a car that is damaged or destroyed, and you might have a travel trailer parked at a trailer park somewhere that is damaged in that same event. 
any piece of property you own that is damaged in a single event is going to go on the same 4684 form. But it is possible that you could have two separate events. Perhaps one part of the year you have a hurricane come through and it's bad news for you. And then later in the year, perhaps there's flooding that goes on and you have more damage again from a second event. But within an event, you might have multiple losses. And all of the losses from within a single event are entered on the same 4684. And if there are a lot of items lost, it's going to be necessary to actually prepare a bunch of supplementary worksheets to track and record all of the losses. And apparently the IRS wants you to submit all of them. Doesn't that sound joyful? There is a publication that the IRS has for Form 4684 that provides the worksheets for listing all of those different losses on them. And I'm not showing it to you, but I can just tell you that it's there. All right, so where we were, we were looking at the description. So on the 4684 on line one, you would describe each item that was lost. And they give you an example here. Show the type, location, and the date acquired for each property. Use a separate line for each property lost or damaged from the same casualty or theft. And then these descriptions correspond to the columns. And on each column, you're going to enter the cost or other basis of the property. Then in line three, for each piece of property, you're going to enter any insurance reimbursement. If you did not file an insurance claim for the lost property that was insured, then you need to enter the amount of insurance reimbursement that you could have received if you had filed a claim. So you are required to file an insurance reimbursement, and if you choose not to, you will be treated as if you had received the insurance reimbursement anyway. We then go on to line five and we enter the fair market value of the property before the casualty or theft. And on line six, we enter the fair market value of the property after the casualty or theft. Then we do a subtraction, line six from line five. And what we're looking at on line seven is the difference or the decrease in the fair market value of the property because of the event. And then we enter the smaller of the loss in fair market value or the cost basis in the property. Then on line 10, 11, and 12, we add up the total of all of the losses for all of the properties lost in this event. And then we reduce those losses by $100. There's a $100 rule. Then on line 13, we the enter of the total of all losses from all separate forms, 4684. Well, you will only be adding up losses from separate 4684 if you had multiple events. After you have added up all of the losses from all of the events, you are going to take your adjusted gross income, multiply it by 10%, and subtract your AGI from the total of all of your losses. So let's go through now and discuss a little bit more about what's going on on the form, do a few illustrations, and then I'll show you a couple of illustrations of how that form is completed. Figuring your allowable losses. You determine your adjusted basis in the property before the casualty or theft occurred. For step two, you then determine the decrease in the fair market value of the property as a result of the casualty or theft. And then from the smaller of your basis or the decrease in the fair market value, you're going to subtract any insurance reimbursement that you received. So what is fair market value? Well, fair market value is the price at which property would be sold between a willing buyer and a willing seller, each having knowledge of the relevant facts. In this situation, the IRS would be referring to a, an occasion where you might have a car, for example, and you could advertise that car for sale on Craigslist and say that you want a particular price for it. Your mind is set on what you think that car is worth, and at the price you're charging, it is probable that you will find a willing buyer to buy that car from you. That would be an indication of the fair market value of the car. You could also go to Blue Book or other valuation systems. You could also have the car appraised. But when we're looking at fair market value, it's essentially defined as the price at which property is going to change hands between unrelated parties, each of whom is in an arm's length transaction and neither is being forced to buy or sell. That's the fair market value of the property. And the IRS wants to know what the fair market value of the property was before the event occurred and then what the property was worth after the event occurred. And the difference between those two numbers is called the decrease in the fair market value. So the difference between the fair market value immediately before the casualty or theft and the fair market value immediately after represents the decrease in the fair market value of the casualty because of the casualty or theft. 
The fair market value of property after a theft is zero if the property is not recovered. Fair market value is generally determined by a competent appraisal, and replacement cost or the cost of repairs is not necessarily the fair market value. However, you may be able to use the cost of repairs to the damaged property as evidence of the loss in value if the repairs are actually made, the repairs are necessary to restore the property to the condition it was in immediately before the casualty, the amount spent for repairs is not excessive, the repairs only correct the damage caused by the casualty, and the value of the property after the repairs is not as a result of the repairs more than the value of the property immediately before the casualty. Leased property. If you are liable for casualty damage to property you lease, your loss is the amount you must pay to repair the property minus any insurance or other reimbursements you expect to receive. Separate computations for each item of property. Generally, if a casualty or theft involves more than one item of property, you must figure the loss on each item separately. And that's why we have columns on the 4684 form so that you can list each single piece of property and do the calculations on it separately. You then combine the losses to determine the total loss from that event, that casualty or theft. And I told you that the IRS has a publication where uh, you can do all of that figuring and pages and pages and pages of charts or forms to do it with. And that publication is 584, the Casualty Disaster and Theft Loss Workbook for Personal Use Property. It provides instructions and worksheets for listing and determining the loss on each item of property for which a casualty or theft loss is claimed. Loss on real estate. You apply the following rules when figuring casualty loss to real estate not used in a trade or a business or for income producing purposes. Firstly, you measure the decrease in the value of the property as a whole. All the improvements such as building trees and shrubs are considered together as one item and you figure the loss separately for other items. For example, figure the loss separately for each piece of furniture. Insurance and other reimbursements, you must reduce the loss by the amount of insurance reimbursement that you receive or expect to receive. Failure to file a claim for reimbursement. If your property is covered by insurance, you must timely file a claim for reimbursement for your loss. You may not claim a loss for property on which you are entitled to an insurance reimbursement and then did not file a claim to get it. There is an exception to this rule, and the rule is that it doesn't apply to your deductible. So most insurance policies have a deductible, and here's an example of what I mean. Insurance claim is not required. You have a car insurance policy with a $1,000 deductible. Because your insurance did not cover the first $1,000 of an auto collision, the $1,000 would be deductible subject to the $100 and the 10% rules. This is true even if you did not file an insurance claim for damages of $1,000 or less because your insurance policy would never reimburse you for the deductible. So you have a car, you have a fender bender, and it's $1,000 to fix the car, but your insurance deductible is $1,000. No point in filing a claim on that. Just pay it and get it fixed. IRS says because the deductible is as much as the damage, you aren't required to file the insurance claim. You can just go ahead and claim it. But, of course, the loss will be subject to the $100 and the 10% of AGI rules. Insurance payments for living expenses. Your casualty loss is not reduced by insurance payments that you receive to cover living expenses in either of the following situations. So it's actually the case during certain types of casualty events that your insurance company may give you money to provide you with temporary housing because the housing that you normally have is not usable. Or it could be that you get extra money to rent a car or the insurance company provides you with a car because your car is going through repairs. We should, most of us have gone at some point through ha having a car given to us, but my own car, I was hit rear-ended because someone slid into me in ice a few years ago, and my car went into the shop. It was there for a week or so, and during that entire time that I had my, the loss of my car, the insurance company paid for me to have another car to drive. It didn't cost me anything to have this rental car. And so insurance companies not only will pay for rental cars in situations like that, they will also pay for temporary housing because you're having to live somewhere else than you normally live, and that's covered. So your casualty loss, though, for the loss in the value of property, the amount that you apply towards that loss in value is not reduced. The loss is not reduced by these insurance payments that you get to cover the living expenses in either of the following situations. Firstly, you lose the use of your main home because of a casualty, or government authorities do not allow you access to your main home because of a casualty or the threat of one. For example, California fires. 
lots of fires going on all the time, and people are, are told to evacuate from their homes, and they're not permitted to return to them until the fire has gone through. In situations like that, the insurance company for those homeowners will typically pay for those homeowners to live in temporary lodging until the event passes. Inclusion of income. If these insurance payments are more than the temporary increase in your living expenses, you must include the excess in your income. Report this amount on Form 1040, Line 21. However, if the casualty occurs in a federally declared disaster area, then none of the insurance payments are taxable. A temporary increase in your living expenses is the difference between the actual living expenses you and your family incurred during the period you could not use your home and your normal living expenses for that period. Actual expenses are the reasonable and necessary expenses incurred because of the loss of your main home. And generally, these expenses include the amounts that you pay for temporary renting of suitable housing, transportation, food, utilities, and miscellaneous services. Normal living expenses consist of these same expenses that you would have incurred but did not because of the casualty or the threat of one. And here's an example where living expense was not paid because of a casualty. Todd was forced to leave his apartment after a flood. His normal rent of $500 per month was not payable for the period of time that he could not live in his apartment. Todd stayed in a hotel for one month period that he did not live in his apartment. The cost of the hotel was $1,000. Because he did not have to pay to rent his apartment, his increase in living expense is $500. So if his insurance company gives him $1,000, but his increase in living expenses is only $500, then he has a $500 profit, you could say, and IRS says report that as income on line 21 of his tax return. And here is an example where living expenses are increased due to casualty. Justin's townhome was damaged as a result of fire. He vacated his home for three months and moved to a motel while repairs were being made to his home. Justin's mortgage payment is $1,000 per month. He continued to be liable for and make payments on his mortgage for the three months that he lived in the motel, and the motel rent for the three months was $4,000. So during this time, he is paying $3,000 for the mortgage on his home, and in addition to that, he's paying $4,000 for the motel. Normally, Justin also pays $200 a month for food. His food expenses for the three months he lived in the motel, however, went to $1,500, which is a considerable increase because he didn't have a kitchen to cook in anymore. Justin received $7,000 from an insurance company to cover his living expenses. He determined the payment to include in his income as follows. Firstly, we have the amount of payout that he received from the insurance company, which is $7,000. On line two, we enter the actual expenses during the month for which you are unable to use your home because of the fire. And we're actually looking at a three-month period here where we have the $3,000 of mortgage plus the $4,000 of rent plus the $1,500 of food. When we add up all of the expenses, we get $8,500. The normal living expenses that Justin would have had for that three-month period included the $3,000 of mortgage and the $600 for food. So if it weren't for the casualty event, his living expenses would still have been $3,600. So the difference between how much he had to spend because of the casualty and how much he would have spent anyway is $4,900. And what you do is you subtract the difference between what it would normally have cost him to live and what it did cost him to live because of the casualty from the insurance reimbursement of $7,000. And when you do that, you get $2,100. So that $2,100 is going to be included in income for Justin, and it goes on line 21 of his 1040. Now, what year do you do that inclusion? The year you regain the use of your main home or later for the year you receive the taxable part of the insurance payment. So it would depend. If you receive money after you move back into your home and the amount of money you receive kicks you over the actual cost of being out of your home, the excess cost of being out of your home, then in the year you receive that money, it would go on line 21. On the other hand, if you're receiving all of the money in one year, a lump sum payment out to you, say at one point, for not being able to live in your home, and then you move into your home again in a later year, it's going to be the later year that that excess insurance reimbursement is included in income. So here we have an example. Justin's main home was damaged by a fire in November of 2013, and he regained the use of his home in February of 2014. The insurance reimbursements that he received in 13 and 14 were $2,100 more than the temporary increase in his living expenses for that period. The $2,100 will be included in his 2014 income. 
disaster relief, food, medical supplies, and other forms of assistance you receive for disaster relief do not reduce your casualty loss unless they are replacements for lost or destroyed property. Figuring again, if the amount of the insurance payment or other reimbursement is more than your adjusted basis in the lost property, you will have a gain from the casualty or theft. To figure your gain, subtract the insurance payment or other reimbursement from the loss. The difference is a taxable gain. Report the gain on Schedule D. Employer's Emergency Disaster Fund. If you receive money from your employer's emergency disaster fund and you must use that money to rehabilitate or replace property on which you are claiming a casualty loss deduction, you must take that money into consideration in computing your casualty loss deduction. You should take into consideration only the amount that you use to replace your destroyed or damaged property. And here is an example where the loss is reduced by the employer's assistance amounts that an employee received. Your home was extensively damaged by a tornado. Your loss after reimbursement from your insurance company was $10,000. Your employer set up a disaster relief fund for its employees. Employees receiving money from the fund had to use it to rehabilitate or replace their damaged or destroyed property. You received $4,000 from the fund and spent the entire amount on repairs to your home. In figuring the casualty loss, you must reduce your unreimbursed loss of $10,000 by the $4,000 that you received from your employer's fund. Your casualty loss before applying the deduction limits is $6,000. Cash gifts. If you receive excludable gifts as a disaster victim and there are no limits on how you can use the money, you do not reduce your casualty loss by these excludable cash gifts. This applies even if you use the money to pay for repairs to property damaged in the disaster. And here's an example of what we mean by a gift. Your home was damaged by a hurricane. Relatives and neighbors made cash gifts to you that are not taxable to you. In general, gifts just aren't a taxable. They're not taxable. So whether your neighbors gave you gifts because your home was destroyed or damaged in a disaster or because they felt sorry for you for another reason or just because they love you, it, a gift is a gift and it's not taxable. So the fact that a gift is related to a disaster or a casualty loss does not create a taxable situation. In this situation, you used part of the cash gift to pay for repairs in your home and the rest you did with what you pleased. There are no limits or restrictions on how you can use the cash gifts, and since it's an excludable gift, none of it is going to affect the amount of casualty loss you're allowed to claim. Deduction limits. Once you have figured your loss, you must figure out how much of your loss you can deduct, and losses on personal use and employee use property are limited as follows. For most personal use property, there is going to be a $100 rule that applies to each casualty or theft loss event. And in addition to that, there will be a 10% rule where you subtract 10% of your income from the total of all of your casualty losses for the year. Now, if the casualty loss relates to property that you use as an employee, then it's going to be subjected to a 2% rule instead of the 10% and $100 rules. And here is an illustration of the 10% and $100 rules being used and applied to a single event. Your boat was stolen, and the boat cost you $20,000. Its fair market value on the date that it was stolen was $15,000. Your insurance paid you $13,000. Your AGI for 2014 is $29,500. Well, your loss after insurance, $15,000 minus $13,000, is $2,000. You then need to subtract $100 under the $100 rule, and you need to subtract 10% of your AGI as well, which is another $2,950. Well, once you subtract out $100 plus $2,950, you have no casualty loss left to claim. And this is why I don't see casualty losses very often, and I think I've had one casualty loss in Oregon that ever beat those statistics. But as I said, other than my computer equipment problems today, we don't have too many casualty losses in Oregon. But the rest of the country, maybe you've got a completely different perspective and they're coming in your door every day. Illustration number two, multiple losses from a single event. On May 10, 2014, Dorothy's home was damaged by a tornado. A tree carried by the tornado fell onto her roof, causing extensive damage to the house and the home theater system inside. The fair market value of her home before the storm was $150,000, and the fair market value of her home after the storm was $120,000. She paid $130,000 for the home when she purchased it. Her home theater system was destroyed by a falling tree, and it had a fair market value of $4,000 before the storm and a fair market value of $0 after the storm. She paid $12,000 for the system back in 2011. 
Dorothy's insurance reimbursed her $9,000, and her AGI for the year is $29,500. Let's go ahead and figure her loss. So the first thing we do is we look at the loss and fair market value. And we can see that we have the house and the theater system, and we combine the cost of those two assets, we have $154,000. We have a fair market value on the house after the event of 120, and a fair market value on the theater system of zero. So the total fair market value after the loss is 120. The next step is to look at the total loss uh, claimed. We've got 154 minus 120. That leaks us with a $34,000 loss. And now we have to factor in the insurance reimbursement, which was $9,000, and that takes the loss to $25,000. Now we need to apply the $100 per event rule and the 10% of EGI rule. So we subtract out $100, we subtract out $2,950, and we're left with a casualty loss deduction of $21,950. So let's see how all of this comes together on the form. And here we've got the form 4684. On line one, columns A and B, we describe the property that was lost. And then in column A, where we've listed the home, we've shown that it had a cost basis of 130, an insurance reimbursement of 9,000, and next to that we have the cost basis in the stereo system, the home theater system. We then go over and show the fair market value of each asset before the event, 150,000 on the house, 4,000 on the home theater. Insurance or pardon me, fair market value after the event is 120,000 and zero for the theater system. So we're going to now take the lesser of the difference in the loss of the fair market value or the basis. And in the case of the house, the smaller difference is the loss in fair market value. But for the home theater system, the smaller number is going to be the fair market value, $4,000. The next step is to subtract from the $30,000 the insurance reimbursement we see on line 3. So 30 minus 9 is 21000 We then take 21000 for the loss on the home, add that to the loss on the theater system, and we get $25,000. We subtract out $100. We subtract out 10% of EGI at 2950, and we have the allowable loss of 21,950, and that carries up and gets entered on line 20 of the Schedule A. Now let's take a look at multiple losses from the same event. And in this situation, we're going to assume all of the same facts as in the earlier illustration with Dorothy, but in a separate event, her ring was stolen. She had no insurance coverage for the ring, and the ring had a fair market value and a cost basis on the day of the theft of $1,500. The fair market value of all of the assets is listed in turn again. We start with the home, then add the theater system in, and then the ring. So the total losses she sustained during the year from two separate events are $155,500. We're then going to move on and look at the fair market value of each of these assets after the event. The house is 120, the theater system nothing, the ring nothing. So her fair market value after the events is 120. Next, we take 120 from 155.5 and we're left with 35.5. We then subtract out the insurance reimbursement of nine and we're left with $26,500. Now we need to apply the $100 rule twice, one for the tornado event and one for the ring event. And then we subtract out 10% of AGI, so we have an allowable casualty loss deduction of 23350 So because there's two events, we have to do two Forms 4684. And for the first 4684, we're going to record the tornado event, just as I already showed you, to get that number on line 12 of $24,900. We have the loss on the tornado event of 25000 and we've applied the $100 rule on line 11. On line 12, we're left with $24,900. But because there's a separate and second event, we have to do another Form 4684, and this is going to be for the ring. So we list the fair market value of the ring. We list the cost basis for the ring. We show there's no insurance reimbursement. The loss is $1,500. Now we apply the $100 limit again. And we subtract out 100 from 1500 and we're left with $1,400. So $1,400 is the loss. The next step is to take 1400 and add that to 24900 and enter the total on line 3, $26,300. We now apply the 10% of EGI at 2950 and we're left with the deductible loss of 23350 that she would again carry to Schedule A and enter on line 10. So when do you deduct a loss? Well, it depends on the type of loss you are having. And if you look here at this table, we can see that losses on deposits, we would treat a deposit loss as a casualty 
or if we choose to treat a deposit loss as a casualty, we're going to claim that in the year you reasonably estimate that that loss occurs. If you choose to treat it as a bad debt, you claim it as a bad debt in the year that the deposits become totally worthless. And for ordinary losses, you claim the losses in the year you reasonably estimate that the loss occurred. Now, if you're claiming a loss from a casualty, you claim the loss in the year the loss occurred. If you're claiming it from a loss in a federally declared disaster area, you can claim the loss in the year the disaster occurred, or you can go back and amend the earlier year's tax return, or if you haven't filed it at all yet, claim the loss on the earlier year's return. And if the loss is from a theft, you claim the loss in the year that you discover the theft. So let's talk about disaster area losses, because I started off today's class by saying, gosh, there's a lot of disasters going on around out there. And if you do have a client who is claiming a loss because they were in a federally declared disaster area, they're going to get some special treatment. As with all other personal losses, disaster losses are subject to a $100 per loss rule, as well as a 10% of AGI limit rule, and they are deductible only if you itemize your deductions. But if you live in a federally declared disaster area, you are given special treatment. Firstly, you can claim your loss on the tax return either in the year the casualty occurs or in the year immediately preceding the year the casualty occurs. And that could be a good benefit. Just suppose that there's a year that the loss occurs and you hardly have any income for that year. So you have this big loss but no income to claim it against kind of pointless, but in the earlier year, you worked a full year, you have decent income there, you have a big loss. If you claim it in the earlier year, it's actually going to save you something. So you get those two choices. Also, there are postponed deadlines. The IRS may postpone for up to one year certain tax deadlines of taxpayers who are affected by a federally declared disaster. The tax deadlines that the IRS may postpone include those for filing income and employment returns, paying income and employment taxes, and making contributions to a traditional IRA or a Roth IRA. For interest abatement, the IRS will abate interest on taxes you owe for the length of your extension if you meet the following requirements. You were located in an area that was declared a disaster by the federal government and you were granted an extension of time to file your taxes and then you in fact paid your taxes. Net operating loss, it is possible that your casualty or theft loss will be more than your income for the year and if that is the case, you may have an NOL. You can carry an NOL back to a prior year to get a refund of taxes that you already paid, or you can carry your loss forward to the next year. Damage from corrosive drywall. Under a special procedure, you may be able to claim a casualty loss deduction for amounts you paid to repair damage to your home and household appliances that resulted from corrosive drywall. Here is a table for figuring the rules for personal use and employee use property, and it simply goes through and really summarizes what I've been saying. Under the general application of the personal losses under casualty or theft, you're going to apply a $100 rule to each event and a 10% rule for your adjusted gross income for the entire year, all events combined. But if the loss is employee business expense loss, you throw out the $100 rule and the 10% rule and go to the 2% rule instead. So if it's a single event, you apply $100, and if it's more than one event, it's $100 to each event. But if you're looking at the AGI rule, it was only applied once for the whole year. Now, if you happen to jointly own property with another person and you each are filing your own returns, each of you individually will be subject to the $100 rule and the 10% of AGI rule. For a married couple... They're going to share the $100 rule and share the AGI rule if they file jointly. If they file separately, they're going to do the 10% rule and the $100 rule, each of them separately. Losses on business or income-producing property is the next topic. Losses on business and income-producing property are not subject to the 2% 10% or $100 rules, and if your casualty or theft loss involved a home that you used for business or you rented it out, your deductible loss may be limited. To claim a business casualty loss, you're going to complete Form 4684, Section B. And if the business casualty or theft loss involved property used in a passive activity, you're going to refer to Form 8582, Passive Activity Loss Limits and in its Instructions. So essentially, if you operate a passive activity, your losses from that activity are typically going to be limited to your income from passive activity. And if your loss on a passive activity is increased because of a casualty loss, you may not be allowed to claim that casualty loss unless you have other passive activity income to offset it. If you incurred a casualty or a theft loss in your trade or business, different rules apply as follows. 
Firstly, the $100 and the 10% rules don't apply. And if the loss occurred to employee business property, claim the loss as a miscellaneous itemized deduction subject to the 2% limit. If the loss is associated with a business activity, claim the loss on Schedule C or Schedule F or Form 1120S or Form 1065 as appropriate. Then if the property was completely destroyed, the loss is generally the cost of the property minus accumulated depreciation. Fair market value that is less than the basis does not reduce the allowable loss. If the property was damaged but not destroyed, the loss generally is the decrease in the property's fair market value up to the adjusted basis. Loss on inventory. There are two ways that you can deduct a casualty loss of inventory, including items that you hold for sale to customers. The first method is the one that makes the most sense to me. You deduct the loss through the increase of cost of goods sold by properly reporting your opening and closing inventories. The loss will be claimed through a reduction to your closing inventory. If you take the loss through an increase in the cost of goods sold, then you will need to include any insurance reimbursement that you received in income for that business. Or you could do something else, which is to deduct the loss separately. And if you're going to deduct the loss separately, you must eliminate the affected inventory items from the cost of goods sold by making a downward adjustment to your opening inventory or to your purchases. You then reduce the loss by any reimbursement you received and do not include the reimbursement in your income. If you do not receive the reimbursement by the end of the year, you may not claim a loss to the extent you have a reasonable prospect of a recovery. Cost of repairs, the cost of repairing damaged property or cleaning up after a casualty must be capitalized if the owner takes a casualty loss deduction for the property. And you can read IRS Memorandum AM 2006-006 for more information on that. So here I have the casualty loss form, and it's part two of the form, or section B of the form. I'm going to zoom in a little here. It's a little bit easier to read. And when you're completing section B, you'll notice that there is no provision on Section B for the $100 rule or the 10% of AGI rule. They don't apply, so those sections are blank. But I did want to draw your attention to line 31. And line 31 says, combine line 30 above, columns B, I, and C, and then enter the net gain or loss here and on Form 4797, line 14. If Form 4797 is not otherwise required, see the instructions. So essentially what goes on is when you have a loss from a casualty loss, that is ultimately, for your business, an involuntary disposition of a business asset. And whether you sell a business asset or involuntarily dispose of a business asset because of a casualty or some other reason, it is still a disposition of a business asset, and, and business asset dispositions are reported on Form 4797. So when you fi go through figuring your lo casualty loss in Section B of Form 4684 for your business, you'll notice that the form on line 31 and again on line 38 tells you to carry that loss to Form 4797. Now, for uh, line 38B, it says, if the loss is an employee business loss, carry the loss to Schedule A, line 23. The loss, along with other miscellaneous deductions, is subject to a 2% limit on your AGI. And if the loss is for income-producing property of an individual, carry the loss to Schedule A, line 28, not subject to the 2% limit on AGI. So I have a short little classwork assignment here for you to figure your way through. And I'm going to let you think about it a little. You probably don't need the Form 4684 to figure Katrina's loss, but I'd like you to read through it and quickly figure her loss, and then I'll show you the answer key, and then we'll call this class done for the day. So here we have Katrina Brewer, who is single. Her AGI for the year is $47,229. Her 1098 mortgage interest is $5,000, and the property taxes she paid on her home for the year were $1,000. She also had $1,829 of state tax withheld on her W-2. On June 15, 2014, Katrina's home, personal belongings, and car were destroyed by flooding. At the time of the flood, she lived in Egremont, Massachusetts, and she had the following casualty loss for the year. Her house had a cost basis of $200,000, a fair market value before the event of $230,000. It was worthless after the event, completely destroyed, and she received $185,000 of insurance reimbursement. She also had personal belongings in the home, totaling $45,000. And for simplicity, I'm not going to make you go through and make a list of every single personal belonging she had, because that's what the IRS would require in real life. But for the sake of today's class, 
We're going to lump all of our personal belongings into a single category. And the fair market value of our personal belongings before the event was 29000 with a cost basis of 45. They were worthless after the event, and insurance gave her 27000 for them. And finally, she had a car. Cost in the car, 26500 Fair market value before the event, 15000 And insurance gave her 11000 So go ahead and prepare her Form 4684 and tell me what you think her casualty loss should be. And I'll actually put up a pod or a poll question for you. And when you get to the point where you figure you know what her casualty loss is, you can tell me what you think the correct answer is for her casualty loss. Okay, everyone, back with you. I can see that there was a little bit of dissension on what the correct answer was. Some of you said $16,177, and some of you said none of the above. So let's go figure how it actually is $16,177. So we're going to begin with what her total loss is, and I'm going to show you how we calculate it in a minute, but we're going to determine that the loss is $20,900. And her AGI is 47229 So 10% of her AGI is $4,723. And we're going to subtract 4723 from the um, 20900 And that's where we get $16,177. So let's move over to the casualty loss form and see what we did with it. And we can see that we begin by showing the location and description of each of the assets lost, the personal residence, the personal belongings, and the car. And there's a corresponding column for each of these, the cost basis in the home, the cost basis in the belongings, the cost basis in the car, the fair market value of the home, the fair market value of the belongings, and the fair market value of the car. So line three is showing the insurance reimbursement on the house, the insurance reimbursement on the belongings, and the insurance reimbursement on the car. We then go down and show the fair market value for the home before the event, the fair market value before the event for the personal belongings in the form of fair market value before the event for the car. We then take a look at the difference, and we're going to subtract line six, which is the fair market value after the casualty, and it's zero all the way across. And we're going to show that the loss on each of these assets is the same as the fair market value before the event. That's the number we're going to use all the way across. And then we go down and enter the smaller of the cost basis in the asset or the fair market value on the date of the event. And for the personal belongings and the car, the fair market value on the day of the event is the lesser number. And for the personal residence, the cost basis is the lower number. And then uh, the next thing we do is look at the difference between the insurance reimbursement on line three and the smaller of lines two or seven, and we subtract insurance from the smaller of lines two or seven. So in this case, we're subtracting the insurance reimbursement from the cost basis of the residence, and we get 15000 And then we go over to the personal belongings, and we're going to subtract insurance of 27000 from the fair market value of 29 and we're left with two. And on the car, we're going to subtract $11,000 from the $15,000 fair market value, and we're left with four. So we go across and add all of those net loss amounts up for the individual assets, and we're left with 21000 We then subtract out the $100 for the $100 rule, and then we go down to the 10% of EGI rule, that $4,723, and there is the answer. $16,177. All right, so that concludes today's class on casualty and theft losses. I'm going to give you your two passwords. The password test does have two passwords, and I'm going to give them both to you at the same time. Password number one is Paladin, P A L A D I N. Paladin. Password number two is Dolphin. D-O-L-P-H-I-N. Dolphin. We hope you've enjoyed this tax education class. Pacific Northwest Tax School is approved as a CE provider by the IRS and the states of Oregon, New York, and Texas. 
we have been awarded the Quality Assurance Standard by NASBA and meet the CE requirements for CPAs in most U.S. states and territories. Tax clients demand knowledge and experience. Pacific Northwest Tax School provides the in-depth, practical education needed to improve your understanding of tax law and to meet the demands of the competitive tax preparation industry.